<laughs> hey there, this is a video of me on a relatively normal day at work. I'm actually waving at you right now, your video feed's not broken. You just wouldn't know because we're stuck here diving in Virginia. Actually, we're not stuck here. Our instrument is in the mud, about half a mile offshore of a billion dollar NASA facility. And this is our third attempt at trying to get that instrument back. This is not dolphins, not whales, no cool fish, although I definitely did feel a couple things down there. Let's back up a little bit. In the wake of World War II, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics decides to build a new test range. It needs to be close to Langley, but also in an isolated location, and close to the water to make shipping large parts cheap and easy. A sleepy little barrier island on the eastern shore of Virginia is the perfect fit. On July 27, 1945, the first rocket launches from Wallops Flight Facility in its humble beginnings as a 50 foot by 50 foot concrete slab and a few slap together sheds. Over the years, it expands bit by bit. The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics becomes NASA and the mission supercharges. The scientific missions broaden to balloons, bigger rockets, and even the precursors to drones. Seventy-five years later, the Wallops Flight Facility is a bustling operations center for military, scientific, and commercial technology. But the decision to build on a barrier island catches up to them. Each year, the beach inches somewhere between 10 and 25 feet closer to the launch pads. NASA puts in hard coastal structures and adds sand to the beach to fortify the facility. But they're losing. So, to start, we're helping them build a model of the complex inlet that is next to the facility, calibrated with real data from two current sensors and a wave buoy. So this is the wave buoy. It sits on the surface, chained off to a larger buoy so that it can sit there and freely ride the waves and analyze them, and then report it back to us through a cell modem. If we lose this thing, it's five grand. It sucks, but we still get all the data back and it doesn't ruin the experiment. This is the current sensor and it's a little bit more complicated, so it has to sit on the seabed to be able to get the accurate data that we need. So we usually put them on these metal frames inside some clamps. We don't tie a buoy off to it or anything, so when it's collecting data in here, it's storing the data on board and that's it. So if we don't get this back, not only do we lose 25 grand, but we also ruin the experiment. Since we don't have a buoy that's just going up to the surface that we can recover it with, we have to get a little bit more creative. So we'll usually tie a line to this four point lifting bridle that is then tied off like a hundred feet away to the cinder block. And then, since we know the GPS point of the frame in the cinder block, we can just go back with a boat and a grappling hook, drag it in between, and hook it pretty much every single time. And then we just pretty much pull up on both ends and go home, in theory. But then, and only then, do we get the sensor and crucially the data back? Well, we took the three hour boat ride down to the inlet to recover the two sensors a few weeks ago and one of them came up without a hitch. The other was so buried in the mud that we could barely even find it. And we tried so hard to get it up back to the surface that we snapped the line that was tied to it. So now it's just down there basically like lost at sea. This video is about trying to get it back. We've got one more problem out there. 
If you're digging a hole in your backyard and you go on a lunch break, no problem. But a quarter mile offshore and 15 feet of water, we've got another problem. <laughs> that's, the, that's the problem. Whatever that is, it's a problem. We're gonna have to deal with that too. So I had to go back to my engineering roots for this one and make up some sort of contraption that would help me excavate all that sediment out of there fast. Now, before you laugh, this is what I came up with. It connects up to a scuba tank and blows the compressed air out of the back of it. So in theory, this should create a really strong underwater vacuum. And I was pretty sure it was gonna work. Whoa, this is so much stuff and I'm gonna be in deep if this doesn't work. But just when it seemed like all the stars were about to align for a recovery attempt, the Atlantic Ocean came out of left field oh. and reminded us that it's hurricane. Look at that. The wind turbine isn't even moving. It's feathered for safety. Fortunately for us and the rest of the East Coast of the US, Hurricane Aaron made its way up the East Coast pretty quickly and didn't really do a whole lot of damage. It was definitely a little windy and there were some big waves, but nothing too crazy. I did get posted by my local paper for surfing during the hurricane in a super sheltered spot and there were quite a few keyboard quarterbacks out there who didn't want their taxpayer dollars being spent on what they assumed would be my eventual 911 call. Don't worry, that call was never placed, and we get a lot bigger surf than this on like a random unnamed storm in the winter. Um, and yeah, I'm out there with all my friends in 40 degree water like every day. Regardless, storms like this are always welcome, for me at least, because it finally gives me a break in what always feels like just never-ending field work this time of year. But after a few days of relaxation, which for me is really like catching up on paperwork, it was time to hit the ground fresh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a no wake zone. <laughs> There's roughly $25,000 that is buried in the mud down there, so I decided we need the A-team for this one. I decided to bring a full boat, 20 scuba tanks, grapples, you name it, and most importantly, I decided to take down to Chincoteague the absolute A-team. Got Cam, Sophie, and Ben all taking time out of their week to just help me get this equipment back. First order of business down there was actually just to find the equipment in the first place. Harder than it sounds, it's very murky down there. You can't see your dive buddy or the frame or anything when you're down there, let alone from the surface. And it's so small that using something like side skin sonar could only really get us so far. So first we dropped a center block at the location that we knew that it was approximately and started circle searching from there. That turned up absolutely nothing. Fortunately though, it only took about three tries with the grapple before... I got it! Alright, um, I didn't plan for this. <laughs> That's, it's gotta be it. It's super tight. Are you off it? No, I'm on it. As Ben and I got down there, we unfortunately didn't see anything that resembled an instrument frame with a current meter on it, or anything else at all the entire time. But we did feel it. It's about two and a half feet high and only the top five or six inches of it were above the seabed. The rest of it was buried in really fine sand, so we tied a line on it and got to the real part of the job, which was digging a big fat hole. <laughs> Let her eat. For hours, Ben and I were down there just 
just digging our hearts out and communicating only with squeezes and shoves. And honestly, we got pretty good at it. Say Aquadop. Hi. <laughs> you. This thing sucks. <laughs> <laughs> After a few hours, we got through about a foot and a half of sand and felt something very sensor-like. So I decided to hedge our bets, ruin a soccer wrench, and see if I could just get the sensor unbolted by feel. Oh! <laughs> yeah! Nice! That's payday. <laughs> it's really very still, but... Mother it's right. Oh, you got the, do you got the, the sensor? Yeah. Okay. Yep, we got it. Hold yeah, on. I got the, the grapples off. Um, so the only thing that's on now is the ball. We'll leave it overnight. It's pretty, I think it's the one side is pretty well out. <laughs> well, when we come back in the morning, it won't be. Yeah, I know. That's, that's the problem. Oh, yeah. Still wet. <laughs> Good morning, day two. We managed to find the sensor yesterday. Slept overnight at this place. We've got a dock slip. It's not so bad. Today is all about getting the frame back up. So the frame we actually realized was about the same-ish. was almost the same price as the sensor itself. So we're going to have to do a lot more digging today and potentially some venture excavating and hopefully come back up with a big hunk of metal with some more metal attached to it. Yeah. <laughs> Got a box you up in here. <laughs> well, just as we had expected, the waves overnight did in fact completely rebury the frame. But Ben and I dug our little hearts out over the course of the morning, and by about 10 o'clock, we noticed the frame started wiggling. From there, we attached a 120 pound lift bag, and here is the first time we had seen the frame in four months. Holy sh Got it? <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. Look at the f all these eyeballs are bent over. Oh, yeah, that's, I was, I was dude, grabbing those. I was that's, on those. That's what happened when we snapped it with the neighbors. We bent all those eyeballs open. Like oh, that. sh. Holy sh. There you go. That's a yeah, buddy. Boat. Yeah, buddy. All right, let's go home. Yeah. Any reactions? <laughs> Thought. Yes, it's, it's, it's great feelings, to see. It. It's great to see dreams. it for real because we've been touching yeah. it a lot. <laughs> but I, I'm really happy to see it. That's true. Yeah. That's cool.